to the No BS Short-Term Rental Podcast, an unfiltered look into the global vacation and short-term rental industry. I'm Mateo Bradford. And I'm John Stokinger. And this is our podcast. We bring the right people to the table at the right time, giving you an inside view and take on the short-term rental industry like no other podcast can. And we're back. Episode four, No BS Short-Term Rental Podcast. How's it going, Mateo? Oh man, fantastic. Still in lovely Portland, Oregon, as you can see. And oh hold on, I gotta get my weatherman thing right. In, there you in go. Beautiful well, beautiful I mean, Portland, Oregon. I can there see. You Not if, if you're just <laughs> listening to this on the podcast, no one else can see. But um well, I appreciate you keeping that up for us for those that, that watch the YouTube. And yep. today today we're actually joined with uh joined by Elizabeth Becker, who is the CEO and founder of High B and B today. So she's gonna be chiming in. Thanks for joining us, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me, John. It's great to be here. Absolutely. So, you know, normal format for us is we we, we quickly talk about the news and, and what, you know, big splashes happen in our space. And then we get in to talk about, you know, who you are, what you do, where you come from and, and, the, and the effect it has on the culture and on our space. Um, I mean, truly, there wasn't a ton of news this week that was like earth shattering uh, mind-blowing short-term rental news. I mean, a couple of things that kind of that, that I saw skimming and, and paying attention this week was, uh, you know, U.S. housing regulator considers, uh, you know, FHFA, you know, considers you know, regulating uh, mortgages and lending in that space. Um, and so I'm not really sure, you know, what that effects that's going to have on um, those that are looking to go ahead and, and get mortgages and, and, and what that means for, you know, for the condos and planned unit develops and that kind of thing. Um, I mean, that was pretty much it. What are your thoughts, Taya? I mean, is there anything that, I mean, it's. It, it, yeah, it was pretty underwhelming. Um, it, it'll be, because again, it's not like it was anything that was, you know, that was final, um, you know, that they, they made some big tidal wave based on what their decision is. I think everyone's still trying to figure out, you know, how, how they want to handle our, our space. And it's going to be a continuing conversation, right? Um, and, but this is just another kind of ledger in the history of like what STR <laughs> regulatory, you know, legislation is. Um, but again, it's nothing permanent or cemented. So it's kind of like those, okay, well, let's see what impact this has. Cause you know, again, at the end of the day, it, it might have a, you know, a, a large impact to, you know, people who are investors or other people who are, you know, looking to buy second and third homes, you know, looking at what's going on in the housing market right now. I don't know what's going on out in your world in Indiana, but here in Portland and, and I know in Atlanta too, like the market is just beyond white hot. And, you know, houses that are completely undervalued are, are selling for ridiculous amounts of cash on the spot. Um, and in Portland, it, it, it actually ties into an ugly housing problem. Um, but we won't talk about how they could be using short term rentals to solve that housing problem and they choose not to. But I'll leave that there. So, so. <laughs> Elizabeth joins us from Toronto. And I truly do not have my finger on the pulse on of Canadian um, the Canadian side of this, are you seeing a similar type of, I mean, I know for a fact that, you know, across the country that there are similar, you know, issues that are, are faced up in, in Canada, but, you know, specifically in Toronto and um, where, you know, your different locations across uh, Toronto, uh, Canada, are you seeing uh, similar things and regular regulations and that kind of stuff? Uh, the regula regulations with the short-term rentals, with the occupancy tax, so, yeah, whatever. I mean, how how is the government putting its fingers in to the to the to the mix and in, in, in trying to take their piece or to regulate how you know you as as small business owners and entrepreneurs are are trying to make a living? Yeah, well, I mean, it it has impacted the housing market here, where rentals have gone sky high because everything's up for short term rentals, and so the government's put a big tax on um, if you're not living in your place for a certain amount of, of days a year, because there are a lot of properties here that are purchased by offshore investors. Um, so they're they're trying to pull it back to make it a little bit easier for um, the general public uh, who's sort of gotten shut out of the market. See, I know that when I used to um, used to do a little bit more with like a corporate housing world, and I was relatively familiar with, you know, Toronto's got really, really high home values. Um, if I if 
like oh it's skyrocketed and absolutely. vancouver is the same yeah yeah it's, vancouver is insane. yeah, so, yeah. It's what's going on over there the um well, well tell us a little bit about um about well if those of you don't know and i i know i brought this up a little bit in the beginning of the show before we hit record um i lost to this bit <laughs> you want to say that a little bit louder, John? I, I don't I'm think you heard. <laughs> I lost to Elizabeth, and um, well, congratulations first and foremost. Um, Elizabeth and, and myself and six other people were were on the short list, uh, the shorties for um, Innovator Disruptor Award, and and Elizabeth won. Congratulations on that on that win, by the way. Thank you, John. It it was a total shock really um but it, it it to me it reinforces you know the the general public's interest in in the destigmatization of cannabis the legalization of cannabis in lots of different areas and the support for you know a, a short term rental service that is cannabis friendly there's so many people behind it and so i'm i'm really honored and i'm sorry i beat you but um it's, don't be sorry. Oh, no, yeah, don't be sorry. Yeah, no, I can't no. really be sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank and, you. And we know she's from Canada because she's sorry she beat me. She's not sorry. And so, I mean, truly. So the first time, <laughs> yeah. I, noticed that, the first time I noticed that, Elizabeth, was so I watched, um, oh, shoot, with my kid. We watched this, this horse show. Um, it's really big in Canada. Um, Oh, Heartland. I think I know the one that you're Heartland. Yeah, yeah CBC. So, yeah, so I, I've watched this show like 12 seasons of it with my family, with my with my my youngest kids. Um, it's, we've watched it on Netflix and Hulu or whatever it's on. Um, and it's a great family show. We've been watching it forever. Um, and 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 you know, as me and the kids, we giggle every time we hear story. Um, but it's you know, that's just me <laughs> being shallow. Um, no, I live I lived in the United States for about five years, and I I started speaking American because everybody corrected me when I said sorry I had to say sorry and you know and so I, I had to adjust the way that I spoke the interesting thing wait, wait a minute wait a minute I have to stop you right there. people had, had you adjust the way that you spoke yeah they, because it makes them uncomfortable no. No. It's, it's true people are terrible uh, you're better than me because I would have I'd have been saying sorry 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 all the way around and just to make them back <laughs> it's just yeah, it, it, it's really strange upset. to me. Like most Americans, they just it's like, oh, that's not proper English. I, but but the funny part about it, and this is kind of sidebar, but I think this is actually interesting because this is a culture show, right? So we're talking about culture in, in the space. But if you talk to someone from the Midwest, like South Dakota, who do they sound like, John? If you, if you like talk to someone from Fargo or you talk to someone from like that space or even people who live a little close to that Canada border, uh, if you yeah. talk to them. Yeah, absolutely. And it sound a little, uh, sound the same as somebody from Canada, a little about, and, uh, you know, some other things that they say. So it's interesting that you got flack. So like, where were you living in the U.S.? I was in Los Angeles. Oh, well, that, yeah, that might be a little oh, bit right, different. Right. But, yeah, like, I have yeah. to say like, one time I was at the grocery store and talking to the clerk and she said, oh, where are you from? I said, Canada. And she said, oh, is that in Europe? <laughs> so we're just going to leave that right there. <laughs> it would have been better if she said, oh, so you're from the great white north. <laughs> oh, man, she said, yeah, she really asked. Well, and maybe she was, again, maybe she was trying to be, I don't know, maybe she thought it was like, no, in Montreal, there's the speaker first. I, I don't know. Maybe. I'm not going to make any excuses for that's horrible i'll just say that well i don't i mean i don't know the education system in the states but i have a feeling that uh, you know a lot of what you study in school is all about united states history of united states like everything sort of all contained within the united states am i wrong i'm not um, gonna give her that excuse I, again come on you gotta know your neighbors right <laughs> like at the end of the day she wouldn't have been like oh mexico is that spain is that you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a whole Come other on. show for getting into you know, compulsory yeah, education. education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, so let's talk a little bit about you know high BNB today, but more like how how did you get here first of all? And for those that don't know, so it's hibnb.ca. 
Um, it is a cannabis friendly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you know, the, the focus is on cannabis friendly accommodations. When you go to the website, it says play high, stay high, get high, and it's all HI. So it's really cute and clever and I really like it. Um, but, but how did you get to where you are today? I mean, what, what made you want to springboard into um, making this accessible? Well, I was in the process of, I, I was unhappy with my, my career status as a writer and director in the film industry. I hadn't achieved the level of success that I felt that I wanted to, and I've always been extremely ambitious. So, um, you know, fast forward to the legalization of cannabis in Canada, and it's something that I have always felt very strongly about. I've been, you know, a, a mild activist in the cannabis space. You know, my, my um, thesis film when I was at the American Film Institute was about the, you know, the stigmatization of, of cannabis um, with the reefer madness craze and, uh, you know, the propaganda that happened ar around it. And uh, unfortunately, because of that, I think it affected my film career in the United States because it's illegal federally. And, and um, so it, it didn't affect me very well, but it's something that I've always felt very strongly about. And so, you know, when I was looking to transition I'm not and not sure exactly where to go seeing the opportunity that Canada is, you know, the, the first, you know, in North America to legalize I, I knew that there was opportunity there I knew that I would love to get involved in the cannabis industry but not exactly certain how to. And so I was lucky that I followed a few steps, you know, wanting to, to trying to get more involved in cannabis I went through payment processing, and then I worked in insurance a little bit trying to which is similar to to payment processing on the cannabis side. And then I worked for somebody who was involved in cannabis tourism. And while working for him, I saw how passionate everybody was and and by now it was after 2018 we did legalize in Canada. I worked at a trade show and and I saw all these people that are so passionate about cannabis and they so like when I, I talked to them about the idea of an Airbnb, you know, a, a cannabis friendly Airbnb, they were like, yes, you should do that. You should do that. And it, it just is the, the more people I spoke to, they all said, how can I help? We love that idea. How can I help? And I felt so invigorated by their energy and exuberance and enthusiasm for it. And as I started to look into the business prospect of putting together a, a website um, and, and running the, the business modeling numbers to see if it was feasible, what it would cost, you know, what the return might be, it's just started making a lot of sense to me. And, and more than that, I felt this you know, exuberance, frankly, on, on following this path. It made me so excited. I woke up in the morning, it's like, oh, I can't wait to see what I can develop you know you know how things can develop more and 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 then running into people who just wanted to help and wanted to help and wanted to help and it, it really snowballed so now i'm i'm carrying this great big you know business which is you know still in early stages but um you know i'm d dead set on 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 bringing it to market in the u.s we're in the middle of um creating an h h i b and b dot u.s site mm -hmm. So we've got a U.S. attorney. We've changed our um, terms and conditions of use, and we're, you know, um, altering slightly in order to be legal. But it is complicated because we have to be different in each state that's right. legally, you know, recreationally legal. But we're going to do it. Yeah. No, sorry. Oh. I was interesting to ask you about like with the states there. So I know that there's some states in some states here in the U.S. that are legal for medicinal cannabis but or or you know certain aspects of cannabis right and, and are you able to operate in the in those states where it's you know you have people who can you know have licenses like california used to be probably when you were living in california i don't know if it was fully recreationally legal but it had been legal for on the medicinal side for quite some time right so yeah, I was trying to get Woody to... Harrelson. I was trying to get Woody Harrelson to star in my film. I actually got his brother. Woody was busy at the time, but I got his brother to star in my film because it was just at that time that it, you know, was it was just building up to becoming um, legal medicinally in California. I definitely want to be in all of the states that are legal for medicinal use, but what it comes down to, I mean, they're they're really backwards is the banking system in the United States and the payment processing in the United States. So um you know, it, it's just going to take a little bit of time. We're going to go into the states that are recreationally legal first and then medicinally. 
I so, wish that it could just be one blanket, you know, like just, you know, being open to everybody there, but it's not going to be that simple. It's good. Right. I see it eventually going that way, but it, you know, we, that's at that federal level, right. You know, and you know, there's certain, there's certain old regime that will never allow that to happen. Um, and so in, but, but we see a lot of movement, you know, going that way. I live in Indiana and, and none of it's legal. Um, you know, I just came from Colorado and it's, it's legal everywhere. Um, so, I mean, there's a big, you know, how many states here in the U S are fully, you know, I'm sure, you know, more than I, um, are fully recreation legal recreation. 17. Seven, boom. 17. So, so, I mean, what is your game plan then, you know, when, you know, you're working on this website, you're working with in, attorneys, um, what does that mean for, you know, once it become, you have the ability to go ahead and, and work as cannabis friendly accommodation platform. Um, do you, you know, what is your business model with regards to, you know, homeowners? Are you working with property management companies? Are you working straight with Airbnb hosts? Are you working with Verbo? Like, how does that work? Okay, well, uh, let me step back. So, so first, we're not just a com cam cannabis friendly accommodations. We also right. offer adventures, which are similar to the Airbnb experiences. And yeah. that's fl flying here in Canada. Everybody's really excited about it. It's like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to set up a, a like a fishing trip and somebody, oh, I'm going to do golfing and everybody, you know, and it, it's, it's very exciting that people want to get involved with, with uh, others who are uh, already involved in the cannabis industry or cannabis culture in some way and, and inviting others to enjoy them. Um, but in terms of uh, the property managers right now, we're open to individual hosts, the community host, and we're working very hard to adapt our technology so that we have connection to the channel manager and to the professional host. So it won't be too long. Probably by September, we'll have those um, automatic channels in place. But right now, uh, it's the commercial, uh, the, the community host. Okay. Now, do... Awesome. Do you see, I mean, and again, we're, we're still just in Canada right now. When do you see the, you know, you having the ability to come in? Um, do you have like a roadmap talking about, you know, where you see the 17 recreational states, you know, being able to go ahead and um, utilize your services? It will be six to eight weeks soon. Uh, that's it? Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's yeah. nice. We're almost there. Yeah. Almost there. Play high, stay high, get high. Um, so <laughs> you, you talked about, um, payment processing and how you weren't really excited. I, that's how I got into the industry as well, into the short-term space. Um, I actually started, um, with ascent processing here in the U S, um, which is a, you know, so I, I understand at least on the short-term rental side and the vacation rental side and the hospitality side, what that means. And, and it is kind of a little bit hard to get excited about it, but, um, that it's it's interesting because you know, as a payment processor, you know you you, you look at like the cannabis and, and what a gold mine that would be to go ahead and and make that possible to go ahead and purchase via credit cards, you know, and and to get whatever you you know, and then the red tape that's that comes with that. I mean, did that hurdle get um, you know alleviated up in Canada? Yeah, we have payment processing in Canada. Uh, people can use Visa or MasterCard uh, to pay for anything on our site. So there is not, you know, th there's not the issue that there is in the United States where Visa or MasterCard won't support, you know, a, a cannabis touching. It, we're not even touching cannabis. We don't buy or sell cannabis. Right. Um, right. But they just, you know, won't get involved with us because we have some affiliation with cannabis. So, so I, that I was going to be my question. Think, yeah, that's interesting. Okay. And that's the banking that's system, right? Yeah, they call us a cannabis ancillary business. And, and probably just because, so we have the, our business model is threefold. Uh, play high mm -hmm. is the adventures, stay high is the accommodations, and get high is ad, ad, advertising for the cannabis mm -hmm. industry. So because we are um, servicing the producers and the dispensaries with their advertising, then the banks see us as touching cannabis tainted money in some way if they're paying us, I guess. Um, so uh, that that's where the stigma comes in. Yeah. yeah. And how but, they. But pay that's you our right advantage. Now. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, 
It's weird. Like with the way that they trace it, it's like dirty money, right? It, a cannabis company's <laughs> money is dirty money. And if I'm taking the dirty money, then they don't want to be involved with me. So it, it's really interesting. I can say that in Canada, that stigma, it doesn't exist anymore. And it's so nice that that you know, that, you know, the, oh, that's a bad thing. You know, you're, you're a criminal, you're dealing with criminals that that's, that just doesn't exist here anymore. And that's so nice. And that's what I'm battling with high BNB is like, let's forget about the stigma. And, and that's what people want when they travel with high BNB is to know that they're not going to get kicked out. They're not going to have anybody complaining. There's not going to be phone calls and that, that come unexpectedly. So there's the security of knowing that they're safe when they're traveling. And also that there's going to be no hassle. They can just be themselves. It's like, finally, we don't have to hide. We're not doing anything wrong. I can be totally transparent about who I am and what I do. And uh, there's nothing wrong with it. No, I think, I, I think you touched on something that is actually close to home, right? Here in the U.S., in a big problem that we've had um, in, in terms of like the criminalization of specifically marijuana. Um, and, you know, there's a huge conversation culturally in, in the U.S. around as this is becoming legal, because it, 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 there's this huge hypocrisy around it, right? There's a huge population of, of weed consumers and purchasers that have been doing it illegally and now are doing it legally within this country and as business and people. I was, I was on a call with a guy yesterday, um, I'm not gonna say his name, but he's a, he's a wealthy entrepreneur here in the US and he's like, yeah, I, you know, I made half a billion dollars off of pot. And his whole mission is to go back and help communities who've been destroyed um, and further marginalized because of people who did exactly what he did, but had their families destroyed, have been you know, sent to in, in, in generational poverty and have become criminals and have been looked at as criminals in this space. And the same, they did the same thing he did. He just happened to be a banker and come from a specific background and built a $10 billion company that he personally made half a billion dollars off of. And so like that's, you know, we're having these conversations within these, these companies, but you're talking about the stigma and it's just, it's hypocrisy, right? Like in, in this space and God, it's, it's good. To, it, that's why it's, it's, it's so refreshing to have you on and see that you're doing something that's going to be leading the way and that it's actually, you know, going to be able to come to the States and, and hopefully set a, an example. Cause again, it's, I think everybody can see the amount of money and how popular it is in in most places in the U.S. Um, the issue I think John stated is the other side of the U.S. that's very much so conservative and scared. Um, it makes me think of your Reefer Madness movie, <laughs> kind of yeah. that mentality that still may exist in the U.S. in certain places, and just how damaging that is. But you know, again, like we can we can talk and we can laugh about it a little bit, but like the reality is, like that mentality has you know, kept this prohibition like grasp on this aspect of something that is so diverse and, and that is widely used um, and has widely been used in the States. So uh, I, I think that part is, is very much so interesting, um, but it also, you know, makes us, it's crazy. I'm, I'm, I'll just say, I, I, again, I'm, I, I don't understand it. And, and again, I love that we're able to have this conversation about it, but this has only been in the past in 10 years or so in the states you know where, where it's actually become recreationally more plausible and, and viable um prior to that it was underground and you might as well have been selling crack because you were getting the same you know the same penalties if you were caught dealing in the space so yeah yeah unfortunately i think it's going to take quite some time for the stigma to um, you know, to, to go away a little bit. There's just some people and that's what they get. And, and I am running into it. You know, there are some um, property managers, property management companies. They're like, oh, our, our um, you know, our owners don't like that. They, because there's an instant association with partiers, irresponsibility. Um, you know, they, they, don't, they don't want that. They don't want to take the risk because they're um, stereotyping who the user is for, for cannabis. Um, but the truth is, you know, there are so many people, they're, they're responsible adults, their parents, you know, their, their family members, uh, the, you know, who's the demographic of a cannabis user? You know, it's, it's really everybody. There's boomers that are using it. Yeah. The, the market between 35 and 55 is absolutely huge. 
you know, and, and then the other half is that the market between 21 and, and 35 is, is huge. But, you know, that stereotype of the irresponsible kid who's, you know, skipping school to get stoned in the basement and never leaves the basement. Like, you know, that's the stereotype that we want to challenge. I was that stereotype, you know, <laughs> you know, I back in the day that that was me. The, the, the interesting thing that I, I think that the, the opposition has and their view on it is and, and what or where they're not looking at it is there's no real difference in 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 alcohol which is legal and in marijuana and, and if you look at the consumption if you abuse alcohol it's it's going to be the same you know there's way more or even an even amount of you know negative repercussions are going to happen to a property to yourself to anything you know, you know, go to a home that is having a huge rager, you know, booze party after, you know, and, and see the see the negative repercussions of that as opposed to a home that where everyone is out on the balcony, um, you know, smoking responsibly. There's a huge difference. And but I think the most people, you know, are going to go ahead, not say, I want to say most. The opposition is going to go ahead and see, hey, well, you know, it just leads to, you know, if you're smoking, you're also drinking. Or the and so I playing devil's advocate here, you know, you know when when you're building, I don't know exactly how to, to word it, but it's that the, these are the fights that you have to have, and I think these are the fights that are and you're probably having today, and these are and these are why you know overall it's just not 100% legalized here in the U.S. because there's such a negative repercussion around it. Well, I think that the effects of alcohol are a lot more negative than the effects of, of marijuana. I agree. You know, agree. Uh, alcohol, agree. You know, <laughs> Completely agree. <laughs> and I, I also think that mixing the two together is problematic. You know, that's one of the things in Canada now that we're legal, you know, they, they do make a, a big, you know, it's, it's very clear. It's not something that should be mixed with alcohol because that creates, you know, some, some problems. But uh, in general, in terms of high BNB, we have a screening and verification process. So every guest, uh, it's a mandatory process that they have to go through. Uh, so we know who the guests are and they have to be accountable to some degree. Uh, it's a, a much more complicated uh, process than what Airbnb does where you don't even have to use your real name. So um, we have the screening and verification process and we are offer also offering uh, insurance to our hosts of 1 million equivalent to 1 million euros in property damage and the same for liability. So at least we can offer that. And uh, I think that that helps, um, you know, the hosts have some security to know that their property is protected. Nice. No, I think, and I think that's important too, because again, let's be honest, you know, we, this, the stigma around, there's no stigma around alcohol, right? Again, you have hosts that leave bottles, like right, for their guests in that space. And so I, I you know, my next question is going to be is like, do you leave like joints for your, your guests or like, do they leave things out there? And, and, and uh, so do. someone actually, well, that's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, do, by the way, cause I, I was online, I was going around <laughs> searching around and it's in, in one, one of her, um, one of the listings on your site is, you know, normally, um, normally I, you know, it's, it's a shared room, um, in the one that I, I stumbled across, it's a shared room. And normally I, um, in other times I'd, I'd smoke a joint with you, but now I just leave one for the guests because of COVID. That's it. Nice, nice. Thought, I thought it was kind of cool. Um, at least, you know, I don't know if that was legal, but it wouldn't be here. <laughs> but it is legal in Canada. I know. Canada, right, and, that's right. a whole point. Yeah. and that's why this is so, this is so refreshing and it's empowering in, in, you know, we're glad you have, we're having you here as a guest because, you know, this is, this is the way it's going and this is where, you know, it should be going. And um, it's, it's, it's exciting. Interesting. So too, so I want to know what your, what you, do you, when you, it's interesting. So what is the pushback, you know, or what are the issues that you deal with from the property managers? And now someone, like you were talking before, like the, the hotel we run, is cannabis friendly and you know we have a cannabis friendly culture everyone on the team is okay with that to you know to the extent that it's not just a cannabis you know it's not a canna themed property right so it's not like you're coming to the art space just to just to experience that but it's here in portland and you know it's cannabis culture is is crazy and so like one of the things that we have to balance in that space is you know how to ensure that people who aren't necessarily as comfortable 
also feel back. Uh, I, I mean, that, 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 I mean, they feel welcome, not feel like they feel welcome and comfortable in the space. And then like from a functional and like operational standpoint, like I, it's cool. I don't mind the smell, but it does take a while to air the rooms out a little bit. And so we like, we've got to change the dynamic of look, we, we have a great space to where you can consume outside and it's not really a problem. Um, but is that an issue you deal with and, and how do you heal or do you get any pushback from the owners or, and, and people in that space that, may also rent to other people and have other people come through their places who may not be as friendly. How does that work for you? And I just want to hear a bit about your experience in terms of, you know, how they've handled that. Um, or yeah, well, there are different kinds of uh, reactions. You know, there's the people who get it and there's the people who don't get it. You know, the people who have a stigma towards cannabis, they don't want anything near it, they don't support it, they don't, you know, they've got a lot of reasons why they don't want anybody smoking in or around or outside or near their property. Uh, and those are the rentals that, you know, our guests don't want to go to, because, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, that's, that's exactly the kind of friction that they don't want to see when they go somewhere. Um, so the people who do get it, you know, they, ha they have a choice. Um, you know, is the smoking permitted inside the unit or inside one room in the unit or on a balcony or a porch or at a designated spot outside the unit? So they can indicate any of, of those things. There's a, a lot of hosts who feel like they don't want it in the unit, but it's fine for outside the unit. Um, and for that, at least our guests know that they're not going to have that friction of somebody who looks down on them with the stigma, with the judgment. And that's really what it comes down to. But, you know, the, the property managers and the, and the owners who, who do have that stigma, like, as I say, they either get it or they don't. If they have that uh, attitude towards, you know, cannabis, where it's a zero tolerance, then we don't want to be working with them. Anyway. Right. But in the end, um, you know, once we start seeing the volume that we are expecting with high BNB, they're going to come around because they're going to want to make money. Right. The great equalizer. Everyone yeah. has a problem with it until they start seeing what the checks, uh, what those checks look like. In a country that has embraced cannabis and, and it's federally, um, it's federally okay. You know, here in the U.S., you know, there, you know, alcohol has been federally okay forever. Uh, but you know, there's still, uh, you know, obviously a, a stigma against, you know. Uh, huge parties and, and, and I'm not saying that that's what's happening on the, the cannabis side of things, but do you, do you feel that there are still a, even though federally it's legalized, are there still, you know, you know, people that are, you know, like against, you know, cannabis friendly, you know, things? I mean, I know for a fact that my wife would 100% is against this stuff you know she smells it she's like ah uh, you know like here in the u.s you know is that something that like you you encounter that there in in canada or is that done is that passe i'm just finding that some hosts you know don't want to taint their home and their property because the people who don't want a smoking room or any semblance of smoking room don't want to have it inside there but in in general i would say that the public awareness is more accepting and the people who were exploiting it and utilizing it it that's happening less because it's it's legal now um there's just a lot more uh uh it, there's more balance to it uh, also because the products that you're purchasing they all have the you know you know exactly how much thc that it has you know, whereas in the black market, you buy an edible and you have no idea. And there's a lot of people over ingesting because they're taking a lot more. And so the products are regulated. And through that regulation, there's some safety that comes around. And uh, in the general public, people are just getting very used to it. Like in Toronto, you walk on the street and you smell cannabis all over the place. But some provinces don't allow it um, in, in public, that you can't smoke it in public. And, and that's also the thing that sort of I'm I'm fighting against with high BNB is that it's legalized here. It's legal, but there aren't many places in public where you can consume. And especially there are no places in public where you can consume with others in social environments. And so the legislation is there, but the practice isn't there yet. So, so they're so it's like Amsterdam. It, so they're making it a, like a solo effort. So you can go ahead and legally consume it, but not in like a group of people just by yourself. 
Well, not in, in public property. On private yeah. property, you can, right. but you can't consume it in restaurants. You can't, cons like, you know, there's strict no smoking laws. And then with cannabis in some provinces, you're not allowed to smoke it like outside publicly, like you, not in a park or not walking down the street. I, you know, the, each province has slightly different rules for where exactly you can consume it. In Ontario, where I live, you can consume it outside just like, I don't even think you're not, you, they, they can't, you can't sell it close to a playground or a school and. Right. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. But, but if I want to go out and I want to have a social experience with other people, because one of the things that I like about cannabis is the sense of um, uh, connection that I feel to others. Mm -hmm. You know, if two people are having cannabis together, especially if they're sharing the same kind of cannabis, there's a a bond that happens and so there's no environment where I can go out and you know ingest cannabis uh you know like legally with others and it's a social event like a, you know a cannabis centered social event you can't do it in restaurants like so the adventures are sort of for that ah. so you bring up an interesting point because culture around smoking period Right is before let's just even take take pot out of the question. Right, I, I think it was pretty strict in Canada. I know it's strict in a lot of places in the U.S. So, uh, is is that playing? Is that part of the issue too? Is people aren't just uh, it, it, regardless of the smoke type that are they just against the smoking aspect of it? And like, is there a culture around like the edible like cuisine and like you know in that space yes. where it's like, hey, you can't bring this joint to this restaurant, but you can bring this Rice Krispie treat or whatever this edible is in in this space, and you can have it. And it, is it like even being infused into like restaurant cuisine to where it's like you can instead of alcohol, I can get a you know I know they have you know, pot infused drinks or, or whatever. Yeah, I, they have everything these days. It's insane. But like, how's that affecting like the culture out there? Yeah, so you really hit the nail on the head. There are a lot of uh, no smoking rules where you, you know, to protect people who don't want to have smoke. And so combusting cannabis is, is a lot harder than um, ingesting infused products. And there has been a real surge in ingesting infused products. But in restaurants, restaurants can't sell it because they don't have a license to sell cannabis. So um, that's sort of where the, the pushback in the general public is. It's like, okay, well, we have these products, but we can't really consume it openly. But you know, on private property, we can. So our hosts can leave some, if they don't want smoking in their unit, they can leave out infused tea bags or beverages or some edibles. They can make some edibles and, and leave homemade edibles if they want. Um, so we, we do have, you know, we do allow that in Canada, in the US, the sharing of cannabis won't be allowed on high BNB. So that's one of the, that's the biggest difference between the Canadian site and the US site is that uh, it is illegal in the US for somebody to share their own cannabis with somebody else on private property. But the host will enable the guest to purchase it by having a delivery service that can come. Okay. Um, that's the difference. Is that and is that different by state? That's a because I I never thought about it like that either. I the sh, the even sharing of it and what's considered sharing as oh, that's sidebar. That's a whole different conversation. I didn't think about that aspect of it either. That's yeah. That's what makes it complicated. Yeah. So in Canada, it's legal to share your personal property as long as you're um, operating as an individual and not a company. But uh, it, in the U.S., even if you're not accepting money for it and you're not supposed to at least this is what our u.s attorney is saying that that's sort of the line and and maybe we'll start there and it, you know as it becomes federally legal in the united states that's an area that we'll be able to back off on but we're going to start there because we want to be 100 percent compliant and don't run into any issues and if we find that we can back off on that then we will well th that's a great transition you're talking about you know you know where this is going and we're talking earlier you said six to eight weeks you know, here in the U.S., you know, you're, you know, where, where are you starting? How are you attracting, you know, hosts? Um, where, you know, where do you project the growth to, to be and explode? And, and how are you going to handle it? Because I think you're, you're onto something absolutely insane, and you're going to have your hands full really soon, uh, more than you already do. 
Uh, I can't wait. And I do have my hands full, but well, so, but it's a big undertaking. It's one thing to sort of say, okay, our technology is open on a US site and the payment processing is working. You can create listings and you can book. But when it comes to marketing and letting everybody know so that we can attract the volume, that takes a lot of money. So we're in the process of uh, raising capital so that we can support, you know, a big go-to-market plan where we'll do a, you know, a big launch planning for that in September. So when we come in in six to eight weeks, it'll be sort of like a, a soft launch, okay. um, working with um, social media marketing and some digital marketing, because there are uh, restrictions on marketing for cannabis. Facebook is anti-cannabis. And in Canada, you're not allowed to advertise anything about cannabis unless it's to people who are of age. So they just don't want the marketing of cannabis to be seen by kids. So it's, it's a little bit tricky. So th that's, the, that's the big undertaking when we go into the US is you know the, the big marketing efforts. We'll go in first as a soft launch. That's awesome. I, I'm super excited for you. I'm super excited for High b, &B. I, I think you guys are on to, you and your, your team are on to something absolutely amazing. And uh, I'm, I really, I wanna have you back in, in a year or six months in September and, and, and see, and see where, where, how, how much you've grown and, and you know, what, you know, how you're planning on taking over the world because I mean, truly. <laughs> Thank you so much. It is very exciting. I mean, being connected to the channel manager is huge because it means as soon as it becomes legal in Portugal, we can have a whole bunch of properties available there within yeah. two weeks. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's, you, yeah, I mean, that's our plan for global domination. <laughs> Starting with Portugal. That's fantastic. <laughs> or just utilizing the channel management. U utilizing the channel management, you know, that's to, to be able to be open as soon as a country is legal, we'll be there. So the, the, that's the kind of growth that we see. But it may take a little while. I, I know in Europe, there's a lot of people who are open to it. In some of the southern countries like Portugal and, and Greece and even Spain, medicinally, it's legal, and, um, but not recreationally yet. But I know that France and the UK still have a lot of stigma. They've got far to go as well. Well, Spain is interesting because they have clubs, like private clubs that are legal. So it's like, it, 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 the, it's so kind of weird the way that it works within that space. Uh, it, yeah, I, I, I think any, regardless of how it works within that space, I think you, you are on the runway to success, definitely globally. Uh, it'll be great to see you grow here in the States. Uh, I'll definitely be hitting you up about our places in Oregon. So um, thank you. And, it's legal. and uh, I would love to support and see you grow and continue to see uh, your success in the industry. So. Thanks, Mateo. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, um, you're, it's, you've been a wonderful guest and, and I look forward to, uh, to continuing the conversation in the future. Me too. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Pleasure.